One of the abiding themes of art history is that every generation views the previous generation's art with a highly critical eye and a determination to produce something new and better, or at least new. So the classical Greek sculptors thought the archaic sculptors were too stiff and check out those goofy smiles. Hellenistic Greek sculptors thought the classical sculptors conveyed cold, emotionless statues, while the classical Roman sculptors thought the Hellenistic Greeks lacked dignity. The Renaissance artists called their predecessors Gothic or Barbarian, but let's face it, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, Titian, these guys are tough acts to follow, especially on their home turf, Italy. Nevertheless, the next generation rather bravely decided to rebel. I'm kicking off this unit on Baroque art with the immediate eras of the Italian High Renaissance, a period that art historians have somewhat confusingly labeled mannerism. It's a kind of way station between Renaissance by considering the work of an artist who outlived most of his own generation and traveled the road from the High Renaissance to mannerism in his own paintings. By the way, the Last Judgment is a very prominent element in the Sistine Chapel, which is a required work, but it is not one of the required images within the chapel. Whether it's on the test or not, I think you should know this very important painting. On this slide, we see two fresco paintings by Michelangelo, both for the Sistine Chapel, but painted 30 years apart. Of course, the subject matter is different, and the Last Judgment is inherently a rather grim subject. Still, what changes do you observe? In the earlier painting, God the Father appears powerful, but not really forbidding. In The Last Judgment, God the Son is a genuinely scary figure. Even by Michelangelo's standards, Christ's body is almost grotesquely muscled, powerful to the point of seeming dangerous, even threatening, especially since he's gazing down not at the saved, but at the damned. Even his mother, pictured behind him, seems to be cowering a little in Christ's presence, unlike Eve in the earlier painting, who looks eager, if a little shy, as she rests under God's sheltering arm. It's really hard to see this huge and complex painting on a single slide, but I wanted to give you a quick look at the entire composition. Note that we're seeing, in some ways, a return to the complex and crowded compositional style we saw in Michelangelo's first ceiling fresco panel, The Flood, which he largely rejected for the rest of the ceiling. And here, by way of comparison, is Raphael's School of Athens, perhaps the epitome of high Renaissance composition. So, what's striking about this comparison? The Last Judgment is busier, even frenetically busy. The figures are twisting, moving, dramatic. The effect of the School of Athens is soothing, rational. Michelangelo's painting is intended to unsettle the viewer and presumably turn our thoughts towards sin and its consequences. It is a much less self-confident and self-congratulatory painting, and as such it reflects the spirit of the age. We'll get there. But first, let me note that one reason we find this painting unsettling is its colors. We haven't talked about color in much detail since our first unit, but take a look at this color wheel again and pay special attention to the tertiary colors. These are not colors we really expect to see, and painters often use them to jar our senses, to startle us. It's a little hard to pick out, but Michelangelo has moved toward a greater use of tertiary colors. This is characteristic of Manner's paintings. We find these colors somewhat jarring. Again, that effect is entirely deliberate. Here we see a detail of the damned. Note the writhing, distorted figures, the sense of movement, the high drama and emotion. We are moving into the Mannerist period, even to Baroque. But by the Baroque era, the church and its artists are regaining their confidence. The paintings are dramatic, but they're less unsettling. Stay tuned. Here is a detail of the painting. St. Bartholomew, who was martyred by having his skin flayed off, is holding his own skin. What's really creepy is that Michelangelo has given the skin saint his own face. You see a contemporary portrait of Michelangelo on the right. Remember that Michelangelo's face also adorned, uh, was also Holofernes in the Sistine Chapel depiction of Judith and Holofernes. So what's going on now? Well, by the time Michelangelo was painting The Last Judgment, life in Italy and in Europe was pretty grim. 
The wars over whether Europe would be Protestant or Catholic got entangled with wars between two Catholic monarchs, Francis I of France and Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. And they were fighting over who would ro- rule the continent of Europe. Italy mostly just got ground up in the process. In 1527, Protestant German soldiers fighting for the Catholic Holy Roman Empire mutinied since they hadn't been paid, and they marched on Rome. They spent several days killing, raping, and setting everything in their path on fire. We also know from Michelangelo's letters and poems that he was deeply troubled by the turmoil in the church. He seems to have had some sympathies with Luther's criticism of indulgences. As he grew older, Michelangelo was also plagued by a sense of his own sinfulness and with doubts about his own salvation. And finally, Michelangelo was once again struggling with a papal patron. The Catholic Church was finally taking Luther's call for reform seriously. The new non-Medici Pope, Paul III, he's the one who called the Council of Trent, set out to end many of the abuses that helped spark the Protestant Reformation. One of Pope Paul III's reform efforts brought him into conflict with the now elderly Michelangelo. This is just too good a story to skip, so watch a short clip about this. It is the only one today, I promise. So the term mannerism is actually a 20th century invention. As you'll discover in the spring, 20th century artists and art historians love to come up with isms. So we've had a glimpse of mannerist style and an introduction to one element in its cultural context, the wars of religion and the Catholic Counter-Reformation. Another element of mannerism was the court patronage of Italian princely courts, including the Medici, who were now raised to the status of nobility and they were back in power in Florence. This was a world where elegant style often trumped rationalism and elegant artifice was honored above naturalism. This painting is not our required mannerist work, but it's famous. Uh, and it's such a famous example, I could imagine it showing up on the test. You read about mannerism in your homework. So what mannerist elements do you see in this painting? The Renaissance drove for a kind of realism getting the bodies right, getting the proportions right, announcing the artist's interest in human beings and life on earth by getting away from what they perceived as Gothic distortions. Distortions reappear in Michelangelo's Last Judgment and in these courtly paintings as well. The hands and feet are often out of proportion and look almost boneless. Mannerists were actually obsessed with hands. Beautiful, useless hands were a sign of aristocratic status. The faces are often hiding their emotions from the world. Mannerist artists were obsessed with masks and an aristocratic culture where people deliberately masked their emotions and intentions. The whole painting has a rather chilly, emotionless quality, typical of courtly mannerism. We are going to get to our required work, I promise, but first I want to talk briefly about the painter whom I think is the most interesting and important mannerist, but who has disappeared from the course. El Greco just means the Greek. I've put his real name up on the slide, but he's always referred to as El Greco. He was born on the island of Crete and trained as an icon paper. He did spend some time studying in Venice and taking in the works of Titian and his followers. But El Greco spent most of his working life, his last 37 years, living in Spain, where he soaked up Spain's fervent spiritualism St. Teresa of Avila, whom we'll meet soon, was a Spanish saint, and capturing its bright, stark light. This is probably El Greco's most famous painting and used to be a College Board favorite. Uh, It's no longer on the list, so I won't linger except to note that El Greco divided his universe into a lower earthly sphere, which is somewhat more Renaissance in style, and a higher heavenly sphere, which is very mannerist. Earth is realistically portrayed and reveals El Greco's Venetian training in the use of light and color. It also shows such mannerist conventions as pale, elongated aristocratic faces and hands. But the heavenly spheres explode into contorted shapes, jarring tertiary colors, and whirling movement that contrasts strongly with the solemn still figures below. 
Okay, this one's really in here because it's one of my favorite paintings, but I think with a stretch, it could be called a mannerist landscape. While this is identifiably El Greco's adopted hometown of Toledo, Spain, the space still does not seem entirely real. It's almost like a dream of the city, where the city is th seen through some sort of distorted lens. And here's one more that I stuck in your workbook. Check out El Greco's rendition of one of our favorite scenes. Okay, I said we'd get here. So why the double title? We don't really know if the painting depicts an entombment or a deposition because we don't see the cross or the tomb or any other useful spatial or landscape clues. Renaissance painters made much more effort to produce realistic settings. This descent or deposition or entombment uh, seems to take place in a kind of artificial space. So what other mannerist elements do you see in this painting? Well, the bodies seem weightless. Who is supporting Christ and why isn't he heavy? The positioning of the legs seems staged and unrealistic. While more emotional than the Madonna we just saw, the emotion still seems posed, contrived, theatrical rather than real. Back to those masks again. And of course, the colors are startling, paler, more orange than red. In a few minutes, you're going to be comparing this to other earlier and later depictions of the same biblical scene. But first, I just want to fat flash a couple more mannerist works at you just to help you recognize the style if you get hit with an attribution question. You saw this on the Khan Academy video, I hope. It's a fresco in the same chapel where the deposition entombment hangs. Note the elongated figures and the twisted bodies. Any guess who designed and built the chapel that houses both of these works? Bruno Leschi. Bronzino was an apprentice of Pintormo. Note how he portrays skin, almost as if it were a porcelain mask. In part, this reflects the aristocratic audience for mannerist works. People who did not need to labor in the sun were pale. And this is an even more famous work by Bronzino. It's a portrait of Cosimo I's wife. Note the porcelain face, the emotionless aristocratic calm, the extremely elegant dress, and those boneless elongated hands. The Medicis, by the way, were now the Grand Dukes of Tuscany and patrons of Pintormo and Bronzino. They just won't go away. Christ being removed from the cross and or laid in his tomb was a popular theme in Renaissance and Baroque art. It is a moment that captures Christ's humanity while also carrying with it enormous spiritual power, a connection between the earthly and the heavenly realms. I'm going to shut up now and let you think about six different artistic renditions of this famous biblical moment. Ms. Jacobs is going to put you into groups and each of you will get one of these works to analyze along with some questions to direct your thinking. You see them here. Here are the six works. They're all in your workbook.